people because of the help of uh, so many of few students who even after the exams had given a selfless contribution to recall the session so thank you so much but also i also take it with uh, uh, take the uh, going to go ahead with the session with a pinch of salt that more some sometimes all the questions may not be completely recalled because it's a memory based recall that uh, we get this almost impossible to uh, replicate the entire uh, question stem of the question also the uh, options but we will try to recall whatever is possible uh, uh, and i hope we have reframed the question okay with this note i will go to the first question so which of the following is not a prognostic factor in rf this was a question see this time the questions are mostly directly from bailey and love as well as your service friend and uh, we were we were able to take uh, references exactly from the doctor to the notes and the video lectures which i had taken also from the rr notes and classes which we had taken so when it comes to urology adrenal and uh, transplant almost all the questions have been completely covered from our lectures itself okay so which of the following is not a prognostic factor in rcc one is age next is tumor site third is grade and fourth is pathological grade okay as you know this uh, pathological ferments pathological grade has direct relationship with your prognostication but as well as the tumor size as you know any tnm staging where for uh, rcc the tumor is t1 t2 t3 and t4 based on the size of the tumor less than 7 more than 7 um, uh, confined to tumor confined uh, extending beyond the kidney gerotas and as advanced disease so tumor size also matters whereas age is not a prognostic factor for not a direct prognostic factor for uh, rcc so this is where these are the references i could get the direct reference from bailey and low from uh, the edition okay so as you know the prognosis of R rcc varies from the histopathological features as well as the nuclear grading also it's based on tumor size venous invasion as well as the site where the tumor is also being present okay the next question is Uh, see this time the, uh, when it comes to urology the questions are evenly panned out with all the uro oncology i have already discussed many times during the sessions as well the more focus will be given on the tumors okay testicular tumor now there's a question on testicular tumor the testicular tumor with the raised hcg and alpha beta protein what is the most probable diagnosis so now the question is on the uh, different variants of non seminal germ cell tumor as well as the tumor marker which is produced by a subsequent uh, embryo subsequent uh, variant of a non seminal germ cell tumor it could be a pure embryonal carcinoma the options are pure yolk sac carcinoma options are teratoma and seminoma as you know the answer here is an a which is embryonal carcinoma embryonal carcinoma is likely to produce both hcg as well as alpha beta protein whereas yolk sac tumor produces only alpha beta protein whereas teratoma does not produce any of the tumors and chorea carcinoma produces only beta hcg okay and one more important thing is a seminoma a pure seminoma never produces alpha beta protein that is one more take home point you have to understand so this i have also also discussed in my notes as well as in the lectures the figure afp uh, seminoma does not know increase in afp so seminoma is afp is never uh, elevated in seminoma okay so this was a question which was directly taken from the bailey and low which is we also reflected in our classes next is the question on carcinoma penis in carcinoma penis when is the dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy done so the options given were clinically impalpable nodes clinically impalpable but fnac positive nodes clinically palpable inguinal nodes and enlarged pelvic nodes so as you know any palpable nodes you can directly go for a biopsy okay fnac or excision biopsy so this does not include and when it comes to enlarged pelvic nodes and tt it is always a metastatic disease and there is no known for sentinel lymph node biopsy the so dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy means if you inject a dye or a radioactive uh, component inside the primary tumor and then you screen the inguinal nodes where the inguinal nodes are not palpable so this is done only in cases where inguinal nodes are not palpable okay so that is the answer the option here is answer a okay so the management of patients where the nodes are not palpable involve use of sentinel lymph node biopsy direct pick up line from your uh, bailey and low and if sentinel lymph node biopsy is possible then you can go ahead with the inguinal lymphadenectomy understand next is which of the following is an indication of biopsy in rcc this was a slightly uh, uh, difficult question uh, in in that point that It was not uh, directly taken from Bailey or Sambison, but I have discussed during my sessions that with the additional references from Campbell. So the options were metastatic RCC. So when you prefer to put a patient on active surveillance, 
localized renal tumor and renal tumor is invasion. So remember, for renal tumor, there is no need to have a biopsy proven diagnosis. Understand? So whenever you see an enhancing oscillation on a contrast CT, it is more likely to be a renal tumor unless proved otherwise. Okay. So any localized tumor or renal tumor is invasion, you have to go. You can go for an upfront radical surgery. For metastatic RCC, then there is a staging process and based on it, prognostic and neither you offer a cytodetective surgery or a targeted therapy. So the only place where we go for indication for biopsy is when those patients where, where we suspect them that we need the exact pathological stage, whether it could be a clear cell carcinoma or it could be a chromophobe carcinoma, uh, chromophobe RCC, then we can put the patient active surveillance. Okay. The reference here is where the renal biopsy and active surveillance protocols. Here you could get direct reference from Sebastian itself. Okay. Uh, okay. So active surveillance are usually for incidentally detected less than two centimeters small renal masses who do not tolerate any extirpative or ablative therapy. That is only for those patients who could not able to undergo any renal ablative therapy in the form of uh, uh, in the form of uh, ablative uh, ablative therapy. A thermal ablation or those who could not able to tolerate your partial mastectomies. Understand? Right. The next question is so this I have also discussed okay in our uh, notes where I where I taken for active surveillance, you have to confirm the diagnosis with biopsy and you have to keep the patient on regular follow-up. Okay, right. Next is uh, again a question on testicular tumor. Which of the following is a true true statement? So one is seminoma does not produce AFP, that is a true statement. The HCG. Uh, Hot of HCG is 5 to 7 days. No, it is the HCG is less. It is 24 to 48 hours. AFP T of is 48 to 20 days. It is also a false statement. AFP has got a better uh, T of 5 to 7 days. And HCG less than 5,000 comes under poor prognosis. So this comes under S1 tumor, which is a bet slightly a better prognosis compared to S3 tumors. Okay, right. So the cutoff for HCG is less than 5,000, 5,000, 50,000, and more than 50,000. So the answer here is A. Okay, right. So this is directly again picked up from Sebastian. This is your reference where you see the tumor markers are HCG less than 5000 interventions per comes under S1 category, okay, which has got a slightly better prognosis. Next question is again, uh, this is again a question from uh, testicles. So there were three questions from testicular tumor. In a stage one non seminomatous germ cell tumor has a raised HCG and alpha beta protein even after arcadectomy. What is the next step? That means we are dealing with a patient but there are no tumor markers. So it is, we are basically dealing with a patient with stage 1S. I have already discussed this. So this question does not have a direct reference in your submission, but it was touched in submission. Bailey does not mention it, but I have clearly uh, taught you in your in our uh, uh, video lectures as well as in the classes. So this comes under a special category called 1S. Yes. That means the tumor is present only uh, in the testicular lesion, the retropetal node, CT chest, everything is normal, no nodes at all, but there is a persistent elevated tumor marker after an archidectomy. That means there is some amount of metastatic disease is there even after doing an archidectomy, but which you could not pick up through your regular CT scans. Okay, So that means it is already a metastatic, it is called 1S. So in that case, 1S has to be treated similar to the testicular tumor with stage 3. Okay, That means the treatment is you have to go for a chemotherapy or to go for a chemotherapy okay so here you have your uh, references does not stay one s one s which shows any any pt but there is an elevated tumor markers after an archerectomy okay so one s has to be treated like stage three tumors understand you have to treat the patient with cisplatin based chemotherapy and when the tumor markers normal then you can go for an rpl and okay right this i also taught you in my in our classes, in our classes, so here you come here, you have your oneness category. Okay, oneness category has to be treated with upfront chemotherapy. Next question is this is a question from hypospirus, so distal hypo in a case of distal hypospirus, which procedure is done for orthoplasty as well as urethroplasty at the same time? First of all, what is orthoplasty? Orthoplasty means it is nothing but correction of cardi, it is cardi correction. Okay, cardi correction where we are going to. Straighten the penis, okay. Cardi correction, and next is you have to go, uh, you have to correct, do the urethroplasty, and you have to do, uh, you have to uh, uh, bring the meatus from a more proximal to a more distal position. So, for remember, for any distal hypospirus, the only treatment of option is tip that is tubularized and incision of the urethral plate. That is the best treatment available. All the others are soap, uh, brachas, and percussion island slabs are usually done for. 
proximal hypospadi access okay there is no mention about this in any of these textbooks but the answer you get you can get it from this line itself so the crystal hypospadi often for cosmetic patients is usually due to the tubularized incised plate uh, plate erythroplasty that is your tip procedure okay so proximal hypospadi access need two stage repair all these are Two stage repairs. Okay, I will just touch upon things. In the what is asopa? Asopa is usually done for penoscrotal hypospadiasis or more proximal hypospadiasis, where you, the urethra is cut open. You create an inner perpetual flap and tubularize it, that, and then you fix that flap over here and do a skin cover. Skin cover is called asopa. Next is bragas. In bragas, what you do is this is a proximal hypospadiasis. You lay open it. Put a buccal graft in this in the first stage. You leave it for about six months. After six months, you tubularize this buccal graft. This is a second two stage Bracas repair. Understand? Right. Next question is, which of the following is not a poor prognostic factor for non-seminal matter germ cell tumor? So proliferation more than seventy percent, tumor size more than three centimeters, presence of metastasis, and embryonal complaint more than fifty percent. Okay. uh here uh, i didn't get a direct reference but this i have taught you in the class remember in t stage of uh, testicular tumor the skin does not depend on the size of the primary tumor okay it depends the t stage depends on the depth of the person and depth of the stem so size per se of the testicular mass is not going to be a, a affective prognostic factor whether the size of the nodes are going to affect here okay you see here The poor prognostic factors include presence of lymphovascular invasion, presence of embryonal cell component more than forty percent, and a high stage disease or metastasis is always going to be a poor prognostic factor. This is this I have taken from my notes in our lectures and notes. Okay, next is the question on renal transplant. After a live renal transplant, after removing the arterial clamps, urine was noted and the patient was having diuresis. But after shifting to the patient, what the patient had a sudden anuria. So you suspect a uh, uh, irrigation of bladder is done, but it is not uh, useful. What is the probable diagnosis? It could be a renal artery stenosis or thrombosis. Thrombosis is a better term. It could be a catheter blockage. It's a renal vein thrombosis or acute rejection. So the answer here is renal artery thrombosis. A direct pick from Bailey and Low. Okay. So in renal artery thrombosis, one of the early complications of uh, post renal transplant, the usual presentation is sudden anuria and rapid decline in. renal function so how to differentiate it from renal vein thrombosis in renal vein thrombosis the patient will have sudden pain on the graft site over the transplant and these patient will have frank hematuria so this is the you have to uh, identify it. this is a typical presentation of a renal artery thrombosis the treatment is immediately do a doppler to confirm it or and take the patient go for a re exploration redo anastomosis if the kidney is viable you can salvage it or sometimes you have to end up with that doing a donor uh, nephrectomy Okay, so we are going to go for a graft nephrectomy. Understand? Next, uh, there were uh, uh, three questions on adrenal tumor, uh, adrenal mass as well. So, which of the following is an advantage of a posterior retroperitoneoscopy for adrenal tumors? So, avoidance of mobilization of solid organs. So, remember, it avoids mobilization of bowel organs. Hollow viscous organs, not the solid organs. So, that is not that's a wrong statement. It has got a large working space. Again, it is not a true statement. Remember, any transperitoneal approach, because of the peritoneal cavity, we have a good working space. So, it requires less dissection. That is a true statement because you know, there is no need for much mobilization. If you go directly to the retroperitoneum, you I can have a direct access to your adrenal glands. It is suitable for obese individuals. Okay. Again, it is difficult because in obese individuals, because of thick pad of fat, it is very difficult to create the space in the retroperitoneum. So obese patients BMI more than forty usually retroperitoneoscopy is contraindicated. So the answer here is B. So these are direct references. Okay, transperitoneal laparoscopic approach offers better view for adrenal gland because the anatomy is more familiar. Whereas retroperitoneoscopy has an advantage because it is extra peritoneal and it is useful for small and bilateral tumors. Okay, and one more statement. Open adrenalectomy is usually performed whenever you suspect a malignant adrenal tumor or very large tumors more than eight to ten centimeters. So remember, whenever you suspect a malignant, you have to go for an R zero resection. That is, you have to obtain complete negative margin. So in that case, whenever you feel like it is laparoscopically difficult or challenging, go for an open surgery. Okay, right. Next is in a case of a suspected case of an adrenal insufficiency with borderline serum and salivary cortisol. What is the next step? So you are dealing with the patient with adhesion, that is, adrenal insufficiency. The options are ACTH stimulation test, 
low dose exam is not suppression test, high dose exam is suppression test, and antenal vein sampling. So remember, the answer here is ACTH stimulation, that is post interrupting stimulation, which I just directly from the patient. And I have also given you this protocol, this management protocol during. Uh, so whenever you suspect an uh, adrenal insufficiency, first you do a uh, uh, 8 a.m. serum cortisol salivary cut. If it is less than the normal cutoff range, then you have to confirm it by giving a coarse interrupting test, wherein you give an exogenous ACTH and you stimulate the adrenal to produce more uh, uh, cortisol. But even in adre primary adre adrenal insufficiency, that is not going to help. Then that it confirms adrenal insufficiency. Then to localize, then you check early morning ACTH levels. If ACTH levels are already high, that means it's a primary adrenal insufficiency. Whereas if the ACTH levels are normal, or less, then, well, then the problem is it's a secondary adrenal insufficiency and the problem is at the pituitary level. You understand? Right. Next is, uh, the, I think a clinical picture of uh, adrenal insulin diploma was given, which was about uh, 15 into 10 into 6 centimeter. So which are the following statements? So that means it's a big incidental tumor that means any what is the incidental tumor any tumor adrenal tumor pick during incidental evaluation okay laparoscopy is done up to 15 centimeter mass successfully so this is not the true statement i said laparoscopy is very difficult especially if it's more than 10 centimeter better to go for an open procedure okay the bigger the tumor bigger the chance of malignancy ct guided aspiration definitely is helpful this usually we don't do that and need to do a functional evaluation. This is very, very important. Remember, of all the adrenal tumors, some 20% are clinically significant, about uh, 11 to 12% are fun maybe functional, even if it's a small tumor, okay? And adrenal insulin loma can be ignored. That is not true because up to 20% can be clinically significant. Either it can, it can harbor a malignancy or it can be a functional tumor, okay? Remember? So how do you evaluate? First, to do a CT scan. To assess and you can go do for rapid wash out studies to differentiate adenoma from adenocortical carcinoma and when do you intervene whenever a tumor size is more than four centimeters then you have to go for an adrenalectomy or any functional tumor you have to go for adrenalectomy this is very very important okay so this is a small recall of the neat ss 2024 20, uh, session wherein i have input touched all the questions from urology uh, renal transplant and adrenals so it's time for you to relax for a couple of weeks wait till the exams. I know this time, uh, every time this neat SS has got varied uh, distribution of questions. This time I hear the questions are more from uh, CTVS and uh, uh, CTVS segment. So need not worry about that. So all of you would have faced a single kind of uh, uh, paper. So I wish you all the very best for your future. Thank you so much.